Welcome, I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television, and tonight with me is Jeff Miller, and Jeff Miller is a former 14-year Special Forces U.S. Army, actually was airborne, A-teams, counterintelligence, intelligence, one of the baddest people on the planet, and one of my good friends, and we're really happy to have him here. Thank you so much for coming in today, Jeff. No problem. Um, and now that I've got you this big, uh, I'm going to make you back it up. Um, hey, there's some really amazing things going on in the world, but I want to really get into some of the stuff that I know you've done already. Um, I know you work for an organization called Safe House because I work with you. I'd like to get into a little bit about what Safe House does. So why don't you give the folks uh, out there a little bit of an idea what Safe House does? Well, Safe House is a training organization. Um, we train all facets. We train military, we train law enforcement, we train civilians. Most recently, military has been taken up. Since the beginning of the wars in the Middle East, military has been taken up about 85% of our student body. U.S. military and other countries, too. I'm going tomorrow to write a uh, proposal for a foreign government for eight classes over the next two years. So, and it's all uh, personal protection, this particular group. And I don't want to say the name of the country because I don't know how they'd feel about it, but uh, it's people that are going to Libya, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. to do security there. Mm -hmm. And we all know that could be a problem. So uh, we do a lot for the U.S. Marine Corps, um, not quite as much for the Army, some for the Air Force, and then the occasional business corporation. We've done mining companies. Uh, we've done oil companies. We've done, believe it or not, b bakeries down in Mexico. <laughs> Down in Mexico, everybody has a problem. Well, Mexico's a pretty dangerous place. So yeah. Mean, when you say training, um, I mean, the Army does some pretty extensive training. The Marines do extensive training. What could Safe House possibly be providing? Well, we do very, very specialized stuff. Mm -hmm. Our 99% of it revolves around driving automobiles mm -hmm. in very specialized ways. And the militaries themselves don't do that very much because it's just not cost-effective. Uh, we have a lot of vehicles. We destroy a lot of vehicles. Um, we had some people down just a few weeks ago, destroyed two vehicles. We have insurance for that. The military doesn't want to put up with that. Also, it's a very special skill. Our student, our instructor body is almost exactly divided between military people and professional racers. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of, of really high-level driving experience on the staff that the military just doesn't have access to from within their own ranks. And then we do a lot of executive protection, which is another pretty highly specialized thing. We do, we started originally in 1982, believe it or not, with uh, doing SWAT type stuff because a lot of our instructors had just come out of the military where the entire concept of hostage rescue had just been sort of formulated. And a lot of us were involved in the very early days of putting that together. So we came out, we started teaching it to police and then that evolved and evolved and evolved, and now the, the driving and the executive protection are what most people seem to want. That's where the market is, so that's where we've gone. I believed it. <laughs> That's a wrap. Beautiful. <laughs> Good job. Where was the action? Thanks. No, we didn't want it. That was part of the surprise. Good job. Good job, guys. Good job. You guys can pass it.
Okay, Academy oh. Awards for everybody. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'd like to thank Saint Mel Security. <laughs> 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 Safe house. Right. So now, as I understand it, um, you've actually been involved in, in quite a few international recovery cases, so and co a couple of famous ones. Um, well, a few, and unfortunately, that. in the early days, some of them were allowed to become famous, which wasn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, I don't do famous anymore. I like mm -hmm. to stay way under the radar these days, but... Uh, back in the early days, yeah, we let the papers have some interviews and about specific incidents, and it led to warrants being issued for my arrest and some of the other guys' arrest on Interpol, and then we had to be real careful about traveling in it. Right. In this business, you don't want to be too far above uh, the radar. Yeah, you've become a lot more low-key, I'm sure. It, you have to. That's the only way you can survive. And, of course, it's a constant battle between... If you're so low key, nobody can find you, then you can never do anything. But if you're so publicized that everybody knows about you, then you can't do anything. Right. So where do you draw that line? It's been a it's been a struggle over the last almost 20 years now to try to figure out where that line is best drawn. And I'll give you a perfect example. I just got a call day before yesterday about a case that would have been very easy to solve had I heard about it immediately. Mm -hmm. But now it's gone completely public. There's congressmen involved. The U.S. State Department is involved. It's on the radio. It's on television. Uh, there's no stealth. There's, yeah. So now to go into a quiet room with just the right person and make a little deal over a scotch or a tequila and... and work things out in a casual way is no longer an option. Right. Uh, it could have been done very inexpensively, very quickly, very quietly, but now you can't do it quietly because there's press all over the place. And this happens a lot, unfortunately. The, the two biggest problems that we have is people have spent all their money in a non-productive way and don't have anything left to spend for something productive. Mm -hmm. Or they have thought that if everybody in the world knows about my problem, everybody will feel sorry for me. Hence, the evil people that have created the problem will just solve it. The, the two worst things that you can do, and eight out of ten potential clients do them. And so, the evil people are just going to make it go away more quickly by either killing the person or, you know. Yeah, or, or, or their pride is hurt. They're backed into a corner. Right. You know. Right. What's a cat yeah. do when you pin him in a corner, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the the you know, once once the world knows what they've done, they have to stand up and say, "I did the right thing." You can't just get with them quietly and say, "You know, yeah, I'll give you a, you know a thousand bucks if you'll just you know turn the other way." Right. They can't do that anymore. Right. So. so what's a typical international recovery look like these days? I don't think there's such a thing as typical. Well, give, me, give me a couple of examples so in, people in can my, understand. In my visit. Um, well, there's a couple of basic requirements. One, the person needs to be being held overseas, whether it's a child or an adult, and in most cases it's a child, but there, there are 
situations where they're adults. So this is a custody, usually a foreign national or an American who's taken them back to their former... A lot of parental abductions, right. a lot of them. But they're not exclusive, right. but it's certainly a huge part of things. Um, the person that wants to get the person out of the situation and has got to have a source of money because it's very expensive to do. Even if I don't make a dime, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do it without making a dime. I mean, I think philanthropy is wonderful, but I have rent to pay, you know. Mm -hmm. So we don't take a lot of money. I'm not getting rich doing this, but there's got to be some compensation and the expenses are very high. If I'm going to go to Syria, that's a good example right now. Somebody wants to leave Syria. Mm -hmm. I got to go in there and risk my life to get in there. I've got to create a scenario by which I can get you out of there. And I don't know how long that's going to take going in. I, I cannot say, okay, I'm going to go there on Thursday. We're going to leave on Sunday. I, you just can't. So, or how you're going to get out. Yeah. On whatever day you're going to leave, you got to go to an airport, buy a ticket and get on a plane. And believe me, when the time comes, you want to be on the very next plane going anywhere. I don't even care. Where's this plane going? Barcelona, fine. Give me a ticket. I'm, I'll, I'll be happy in Barcelona. I don't care if it's going it's to London. It's going to Frankfurt. Right? It's going to Singapore. <laughs> yeah. I don't care where it's going. How yeah. much is the ticket? I'm going to slap the money down and buy that. That's the most expensive plane ticket in the world. Yeah. Absolutely the most expensive plane ticket in the world. There's no way around it. Yeah. I can't go to Expedia.com or Travelocity and get the super duper super saver fare. Yeah, the seven day advance. Yeah, notice, with the seven day advance notice because I don't know when I'm going to be doing it. So people have to understand it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just don't have the means to do it, which is sad, but what are you going to do? Um, so those, those limiting factors, one, I, I don't want to be breaking US law. I want to make absolutely sure that the person is in, is in compliance with U.S. law. I don't care about breaking the laws of other countries in the Middle East or wherever, mm -hmm. but I want to come home and live here, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to break U.S. law and the person has to be able to afford it. Those are the two biggest limiting factors right there. And I have gotten approaches on many an occasion that w either one or the other of those could not be met. Usually it's the money, but every once in a while it's, you know, it's custody it's, doesn't it's meet the custody, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't meet the right um, smell test for me. So, those are the two big things. Once those two things are satisfied, my success rate is uh, well up above ninety percent. So it must be hell of a satisfaction to be. Able oh, to it's do wonderful. That. Yeah, it's wonderful when you succeed. Yeah, it's wonderful when the because usually you're dealing with family members that are just so emotional. One thing you gotta be very careful about is they want it done right now, right now, right now. And haste can really make you make mistakes and yeah. you've gotta be very, yeah. we'll do it on the time schedule that we can do it. You know, if at this time of year, it may be mid-January. They might not be home for Christmas. I just have to let you know that in advance because I'm not going to rush to try to satisfy this emotional need. I understand it, but I'm not going to fail or get myself in a jam because you waited till December 12th to right. call me and you want somebody home by Christmas. Yeah, dead or in a <laughs> yeah, midnight yeah. express prison right. somewhere in Syria. So, right? so uh, yeah, yeah the, the, that, that has to be applied to every, every thing. And, and generally speaking, at any given time, there's three or four of these in the works. And if one out of 20 actually happens, um, that's a, probably a pretty good ratio. Right. You know, so, but you gotta talk to the other 19 people. Sometimes they're just insane. Right. I mean, I, I get calls from people who are just crazy, especially guys who want me to sort of come and be with them to give them credibility. I, I got some calls from a young Marine in Florida not too long ago that were just. 
out there, completely off the graph. The guy's telling me he's got tanks and he's got Barrett 50 caliber assault rifles. I said, I don't use any of that stuff. Right. I don't, what are we going to do guns with that? Guns are not you know? going with me, right? Yes, <laughs> guns are not going with me. Guns cause more problems than they solve in my business. Who am I going to shoot? Right. I mean, really, the local cops, the, the father that took his own daughter. I mean, he doesn't deserve to die for that. He may not deserve to still have his kid in Iran or wherever they are, but he certainly doesn't deserve to die because of it. I'm not going to go shoot the guy. Right. And unfortunately, the American public sees movies. I was going to say, too many movies. <laughs> and they, they think that movies are where, you know, they want the expendables. They want, you know, explosions and, and weapons. And, and, and that's not the way it works. My, my, my goal is to slide in there without being noticed and slide back out without being noticed and have the whole thing over and then somebody comes and goes what the heck happened well and that's how you come back and don't go to prison yeah exactly because interpol will come follow you oh, if you use a gun and that's the other thing gun. people don't in a movie you're within a framework of 90 minutes 120 minutes whatever it is in my business there are long-term consequences sometimes they don't even manifest for months right you know, and then all of a sudden you hear, oh, by the way, don't go to so-and-so because there's a warrant out for your arrest. Yeah. What, who, me? No, yeah, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? But that, and, and if you have been cautious and it's, you know, relatively minor infractions and misdemeanors that you have done, like, uh, you know, I've done things like rented cars and abandoned them mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, made forgeries in people's passports and things like that. That's stuff that they're probably not going to come to her. But if there's dead cops behind you, come on. Yeah, bullets in you people's know, you can't, homes. You can't, and, yeah, 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 you can't do movie stuff in the real world. You just can't. And it, it's sad that so much of the American public, or nowadays <laughs> video games, which is even worse, I mean, these kids are being educated by video games where a body count of 10,000 is a barely uh, adequate score. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. So you raised the issue of Syria. I want to go more to the current events. Okay. Um, it, it looks like the Syrian government is going to fall ultimately, um, and it looks like there are some some pretty extreme differentiators between what are now considered the recognized rebels, which I find to be somewhat entertaining and frightening yeah. at the same time, and then the Al Qaeda backed uh, group that is fighting alongside of them yet bifurcated from this other group. There's clearly sarin gas um, in large stockpiles, and God only knows what else. From your experience in being in the Middle East and from and being involved in these things, the threat's pretty extreme. But what do you think the realism is of our government being able to control that, and what is the threat, and where the hell is it going to end up? I don't know. I I can't even imagine a good outcome from what's going on in Syria. I can only imagine a half a dozen variations on a bad outcome. If we think that Assad is going to be overthrown and legions of happy Syrians are going to come in, uh, adopt the U.S. Constitution, elect a representative government with an independent judiciary and live happily ever after, we're just nuts. Right. In the Middle East, predominantly, but in the entire Muslim world, which extends into Asia, there is a hunger by a fairly small minority for a Muslim caliphate that encompasses the entire Muslim world mm -hmm. from North Africa through the Middle East and down into Central and Southern Asia. Those people are the most committed, 
Those people are the most violent. Those people are the most willing to do whatever has to be done to get their way. Mm -hmm. And they are committed to this idea. Nobody else is organized enough to stand in front of them and they're interfere with their... They're willing to die their, to defend them. To they're, defend they're totally willing to die to create what they want to create, and not too many people are willing to die to stop them. Right. We won't even admit that they're there. Yeah, at least our current administration won't. Yeah, our current administration. I don't think the... I, the just the general, even the, sta the State Department... Uh, bureaucracy that survives various administrations and continues, they're not willing to admit that it's happening. They're, how can you win a war that you won't admit is going on? Mm -hmm. There was just a new manual put out for soldiers going to Afghanistan. They're not allowed to criticize anything Islamic. They're not allowed to criticize um, women being forced into burqas. They're not allowed to criticize pedophilia. They're not allowed to say anything against the enemy. Now, can you imagine World War II if we had a policy that said you're not allowed to criticize anything the Nazi party does. You're not allowed to criticize the gassing of Jews. You're not allowed to criticize slave labor. You're not allowed to criticize. <laughs> I mean, where really? are we as a people right. when we cannot say our enemies are bad. What they are doing is bad. Oh, no, 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 no. It's just different. Well, and it isn't about the religion itself. because no. then we, it, It's about the extremity of the people yeah. at that end. And you, you said that in the beginning of your... They're story. probably not more than 7 to 10 percent. Right. But when Hitler took over Germany, there weren't more than 7 to 10 percent Nazis in the party. Right. You don't have to be... Uh, we, we have this... Well, look, look process in America. Look what's you have in Egypt, to be right? the majority to win. You don't have to be the majority to win. Look what's happened in Egypt. I mean, yeah. Morrissey got control. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood got control of Egypt. And what did he do? Immediately declared he's no longer answering to yeah. the Supreme Court of, of course. Egypt. It is, so it, is, it is almost the exact move that Hitler made. Right. Almost exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's the playbook that he's yeah. working from. Yeah. And what are we doing? We're giving them new jets. We're giving him new Last fighters week. now. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> he's certainly not being punished for this action. So, as we go, bop, 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 like that. All right? We're going we're gonna to do that headshot just in case that body armor stopped him from going all the way down. Okay, we got three round magazines. Okay, coaches, hand one, three round magazine. Forward to your fire. Fire is lock and load. Let's see some good killing here, people. Let's see some good killing. Ready on the firing line. Fire! I've lived over there, and I have seen people who are my good, good friends get virulently anti-American after a couple of drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they're not supposed to drink, but... Let's face it, they do. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people who were nice people who I enjoyed, who I had over to my home for barbecues and parties and thought were my really good friends and were my really good friends, get a couple of drinks, get that truth come bubbling out and just start saying them, you know, just be anti-American and pro-terrorist. Look at the celebrations that they've had. You know, a, a, a Hawaiian-style shirt with pictures of the burning Twin Towers is one of the most popular garments in the Mideast now. Wow. So you don't know... And it doesn't say a lot, does it? No, you don't, you don't really know where the masses come down. There's obviously people in there that come down on both sides. But once again, I have to go back to the Nazi Germany comparison. When Hitler took power, I think it was somewhere around 7 to 9% of the country was actually members of the Nazi party, but he got 36% of the vote on the first ballot. So do we know where that other 29% might be in the Arab world? I don't think we know. And is it only 29% or is it bigger than that? We don't know. Um, you can't just make an assumption that the vast majority are 
horrified and, and will, you know, jump up and be on our side when the time is right. You can't make that assumption. You well, and at what point is some of it going to be, in their mind, you know, do payback for, for the perceived treatment of the yeah. last 50 years? I mean, well, you, you got to remember all those countries over there were created by England and France after the First World War. That's my point. They don't have yeah. anything to do with who lives there. Right. In a perfect world, there would be a Kurdistan. Right. But there isn't. Right. Um, they've now done quite a good job of taking over the northern part of Iraq and are running it more uh, efficiently than the rest of the country is being run, but they don't have their own country, and it's because uh, they didn't have a chip on the table in uh, Paris at the end of World War I. Right. And nobody felt it was uh, in anybody's best interest to give them a country, so they just got, you know, some of you are in Syria and some of you are in Iraq and some of you are in Turkey, and, you know, that's just the way it is. So much of the, the Saudi royal family put in place by the Brits. The Brits liked the guy, so they said, you can be in charge. Didn't have anything to do with what the people in Saudi Arabia wanted. There's still a huge minority there that wishes those people would go. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I'd like to continue this conversation in the future if you'll sure. come back. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for coming in. Okay, well, thank you. Right. With me this evening has been Jeff Miller. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. Thank you.